Good afternoon. Welcome to for welcome to this session sharing data to safeguard children. We've been working. Um, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Viv Adams. I'm principal policy advisor in the ICO's Parliament and Government Affairs team. I work closely on the data sharing code and this is my colleague Stacey. Hi, yeah, I'm Stacey Edgerton. Um, I'm a senior policy officer in the ICO's high priority inquiries team. Um, I work more specifically on the policy side and I've done quite a bit of work in the ICO in relation to public sector data sharing. Thanks, Stacey. I just wanted to mention that you should find the audio fine, but sometimes the visual feed has been glitching with me. So, um, but you should be, still be able to hear me and Stacey is here to pick up if there is a problem. It's not your machine, it's not the heat. Anyway, I hope you're all doing okay in this heat. So, Thank you for attending this session. We've been working on this area for a while with stakeholders and practitioners. And today we want to hear directly from you to get your insights. We want to hear about what challenges you are facing and how we can overcome them together. We're going to do a number of things in the session. We'll tell you about our thinking on sharing data to safeguard children. And we'll tell you about the work we're doing with others, both practitioners and stakeholders, and we'll walk through a case study. But of the greatest importance, as I just said for us today, is to hear from you about what you think the challenges are and how our work can help address them. As you know, data protection is only one aspect of the things you need to consider in sharing data to safeguard children. There are a range of other major ones. Today, of course, we're focusing on the data protection element. That should have moved us on to the next slide. Has it? Yes, it has, sorry. We want to hear from you today, as I said, about what data protection challenges you face in sharing data to safeguard children. Do you have any comments on the work we're doing in this sphere? So, for example, we're working on a resource to help you to share data to safeguard children. I'll tell you more about that later, but we want to hear from you as to what sort of resource would be most helpful. We want to give you confidence to share data, so please tell us your thoughts. Tell us about the challenges you face when seeking to share data to safeguard children. Please write your comments and thoughts in the chat throughout the session. We're very keen to hear from you. If you have any questions for us today, you can write those there too. And later on, we'll aim to answer them. Even if there isn't enough time to answer all the questions, we'll be noting what you say. And it will help us for the future. Your comments are very welcome indeed and will help us to support you and others in sharing data to safeguard children. We now have a poll, Stacey. Thanks, Viv. Yeah, we were just wanting to um, start off with a quick poll today. Um, more for our benefit, really. Um, we just wanted to um, do a bit of a check of who's in the room today. So there should be two questions that will pop up on your screen. One asking which sector you're from and also um, what your job role is. Um, if you can select an answer from each of those and then it'll just help us when considering the responses and, and comments and questions that come through just to know who was kind of joined in on the session today. So I think that poll should pop up on the screen soon for you to participate in. Do you think uh, everyone's had time to do that? Yes, I think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. OK. Now here we have John, the Information Commissioner, whom you saw earlier. Um, John Edwards, the Information Commissioner, has stated that data protection is a can do, not a don't do. 
He's been carrying out a listening tour across the UK over the past few months and has emphasised that children's privacy is a big priority. He's noted that children and young people have rights. At a recent data sharing workshop, which we'll talk about later, carried out in conjunction with the Children's Commissioner for England, John also said that children's safeguarding really is the cutting edge of data sharing. We know this from both the individual cases that make the news and are followed up by inquiries and reviews, but also from the very many children missing in education of which the public never hear. We know it's imperative that organisations have the knowledge and confidence to share data where it will safeguard children and young people. Our fundamental message to you is that data protection is not a barrier. It doesn't, data protection law doesn't present a barrier to sharing personal data. What it does do is provide a framework that enables data sharing to take place fairly and proportionately in a way that helps engender public trust. This is true whether the sharing is in order to safeguard children or for other purposes. Many of you will be familiar with the data sharing code of which there is a picture on the slide. And the code emphasizes, sometimes it can be more harmful not to share data. In an urgent situation or in an emergency, we stress that you should not hesitate to share data to prevent harm. Even outside an emergency, you should do what is necessary and proportionate to safeguard a child. I've mentioned already the challenges to sharing. We know that there are some organisations have concerns that data sharing is a barrier to sharing data. This is something we need to examine carefully. We want to hear from practitioners what these are and how we might overcome them. We know that there are obstacles such as organisational, cultural. These might be, for instance, perceptions, staff views, traditions, and also obstacles such as technological ones. Please tell us. It's worth looking at a real example where the cultural barriers were based in perception rather than in reality. A couple of years ago, we received concerns from a stakeholder organisation that data protection law was preventing data being shared with them, and this had an adverse impact. We did extensive research directly with them and discovered that the problem lay not in the law, but in people's perceptions. We worked with them to try to overcome these and find solutions. I emphasise that it doesn't mean we think all challenges are ones of perception. We would never seek to assume or to patronise, but these findings are worth bearing in mind. Now, Stacey has another poll, I believe. Yeah, thanks, Viv. Um, so, yeah, we've got another poll um, and we now want to ask what you think the main challenges are, um, the main challenges and obstacles are for sharing data to safeguard children. So again, the poll should appear up on um, screens and you can select one or two options for this one. We've given five options. But if you think the challenges and obstacles being faced are something else, then please do write these in the chat and we'll pick those up from from there um, and we'll feed back the results for this one later in the session. So I think the poll should be up on your screens now, so we'll just give you a few seconds just to answer that. Some people seem to be reporting problems uh, with a frozen screen. Ah, but the polls come up. I hope everyone else is OK now. Uh, 
Are we getting answers in the poll, do you think? Hopefully. Yes, we're getting answers. That's good. It's working. I think we're probably OK to continue okay. now. Then. OK. Excuse me, my screen is slightly freezing. As I've already emphasised, the ICO wants to work with you and your organisations to overcome these and other challenges and build your confidence. We've already engaged in this by means of our data sharing code and hub resources, but more work is needed from everyone, from all of us, including government and organisations. Today's session plays a really important part in this work to understand the challenges, to hear from you, to inform what we're doing. And it will also provide further support to help us in the production of a new resource that will help you to safeguard children. As I said earlier in the session, the ICO has been working closely with the Children's Commissioner for England. Oh, excuse me, I seem to have missed a slide. Have I missed a slide? I'm so sorry. There are some issues. Poll number two. And then, apologies for this glitch. We have the poll. It's fine. That's my fault, Viv. Carry okay. on. I think, I think apologies we're right. my, about screen that. Is, my screen is slightly freezing. I do apologise. So I understand that's why some of you are having freezing problems. OK, so we I said we were working closely with the Children's Commissioner for England. Um, the ICO and the Children's Commissioner want to bury some myths around data sharing and children's safeguarding, but also to seek solutions to the challenges and issues that exist. In the next coming up slides, I'll explain recent aspects of this work. Both the ICO and the Children's Commissioner are united on this front, and we want to make it as easy as possible for practitioners to share data in order to safeguard children. This, uh, this slide um, is about our work with the Children's Commissioner on a project to improve data sharing in child safeguarding sessions. There's our logo. And this map here shows the spread of over 100 practitioners from around England who fed into our data sharing workshop in May to put children at the heart of data sharing. The Children's Commissioner's Office has emphasised that the sharing of the sharing of safeguarding information is essential for prompt interventions to protect children. It's also essential when designing community services to support young people and their families. Serious case reviews into the deaths and abuse of vulnerable children alongside government reports have exposed difficulties in sharing data across agencies for safeguarding children and also in the designing of services. As I said, we ran a joint workshop, the ICO and the Children's Commissioner for England in May to hear directly from practitioners, including local authorities and government departments, such as the Department for Education, about the challenges involved in sharing data. The aim of the session was to identify what short and long term measures could be introduced to ease data sharing pressures. The worktop workshop was attended by over 100 practitioners across England, with more taking the time to complete a survey that um, was sent out to them. The Children's Commissioner's Office also engaged in one to one interviews with government departments. In the workshop, we all heard that there are some examples of good work taking place across the country where data sharing is being used effectively to provide and design services. The workshop heard from Somerset County Council, which has used government funds to build a bespoke database, which gathered data from numerous information systems to identify individuals and families eligible for early support. However, we also heard that this is not a universal experience. Approaches to data sharing in child safeguarding settings can be inconsistent 
with several structural, technological, resource and cultural factors preventing more effective sharing of information. There doesn't always appear to be a common understanding about how data should be shared proportionately or in some instances which legislation can be used as a basis for sharing data. This is especially challenging when safeguarding practitioners are working across localities or are seeking access to health data. The Children's Commissioner's Office, as I said, is also working with government departments, including the DfE, to develop long term solutions which will allow best practice to be shared, overcome legislative barriers and build new safeguarding hubs. Our ongoing work to help practitioners is, as I've mentioned, the Children's Commissioner's Office work and the ICO is, is going to produce a work, a resource to help you, to help practitioners. Stacey and I are now going to walk you through, talk you through a case study, working to ensure data can be shared to improve outcomes for disadvantaged children and families. In this example, which is based on real life, we're going to talk through how two local authorities worked with other organisations to ensure social workers have timely access to the information they need about children and their families. As we know, social workers need frequent access to information about children and their families when deciding what support is most appropriate for them. That need is especially acute, as we know, when they have to make a decision on whether there's a safeguarding risk. So two local authorities in different areas of the UK decided to find a data sharing solution to ensure that social workers would have all the information they need right from the start. So Stacey, how did they do this? They partnered with a not-for-profit organisation and they worked together to explore the information, governance and ethical imp implications of accessing and using special category data within social care. They ran ethics workshops with the project team, as well as conducted extensive user research with those most likely to be impacted by the data sharing, such as residents who've had contact with social workers. And they also identified the key information that social workers needed access to. So this included the contact details of the relevant lead practitioners from other services, such as police, housing, schools and adult social care, as well as basic information about when the service was last involved with the family. From the point of view of data protection law and good practice, the two councils wanted to ensure that an overarching framework would be in place, allowing the data to flow, a framework that would give staff the confidence to share the data and make decisions about it. So what were the results from the research and the workshops that took place? Well, the research and workshops that they undertook demonstrated that the sharing, um, that sharing the data would have the following benefits. So it would reduce the amount of time social workers spend looking for information. It would enable a more joined up approach among services. For example, children's social care working more closely with adult social care. It would also ensure social workers have access to all of the information that they need, both when assessing safeguarding risk and making support decisions for children and their families. And also allow children and families to access better, more timely services. So what did the local authorities do next? So before sharing any data, the two local authorities worked together. They took actions and put measures in place to ensure that the data would be protected and shared responsibly. Can you elaborate on what those measures they put in place, Viv? Yes, um, thanks, Stacey. The measures included data protection by design and default, i.e putting in place technological and organisational measures to implement data protection principles effectively and safeguard individual rights throughout the life cycle of the data sharing activities. A DPIA, data protection impact assessment, 
a data sharing agreement between the controllers, privacy information ensuring transparency for the individuals who data is being shared, and last but not least, the parties put in place staff training for both staff and contractors and ensured it was refreshed regularly. For that, Viv. So following the success of creating the initial digital data sharing platform, the parties identified that they could target a wider range of issues for early intervention by extending the multi-agency data sharing arrangement even wider. So they went on to extend the data sharing platform to involve, to involve sharing health data as well. So this meant bringing on board other organisations such as Children's Public Health um, and the Health Visiting Service, as well as Children and Adolescent Mental Health Services or CAMS as it's more commonly known. So this enabled a more joined up approach and allowed operational decisions to be made on day to day sharing to be done with confidence. And the partners across the organisations work together to review and update the measures that Viv just mentioned, such as the DPIA and the data sharing agreement, um, which is really important. Um, they should be kind of active and, and reviewed throughout. Um, and this all kind of reflected that extended multi-agency data sharing. Thanks very much, Stacey. As I said, that was based on a real life scenario. Oh, I wonder, do we have the poll results yet? Yes, we do. The results are in um, oh. and I've got those up in front of me, so I will share those with you now. So at the top end, 38% um, of you came back saying um, that you think the main challenge and obstacles being faced when sharing data to safeguard children is fear of doing something wrong. Um, so obviously being alive to the potential risks of data sharing is obviously a real positive thing. Um, it means you can identify any potential risks before sharing the data. However, it does become an issue if that fear is then getting in the way of sharing data that, that should be shared. So for example, this might be a fear of further action um, or a fine from the ICO. Um, and we've got a video coming up on that soon that should offer some reassurance on this. So in second place, then we'd got um, at 23 percent uncertainty about data protection law. So I think we acknowledge that, you know, led all legislation can be tricky sometimes, but that's why we try and produce lots of guidance and resources at the ICO um, to try and help organisations navigate some of those key issues. Um, and Viv's going to talk about some of those data sharing resources that we've got in a moment. Um, next up is culture. Um, that was 19% of your reported culture as being a challenge, an obstacle. Um, so that might be sort of embedded traditions or practices. Um, a common one that we see quite a lot is that you often need consent um, and Viv's going to touch on, on that again, uh, again shortly. And then at the bottom um, with sort of 9% um, we've got tech and then 6% we've got resourcing. Um, so I think with tech it's just often the case that uh, especially with multi-agency sharing the systems might not be talking to each other, might not be compatible um, and it might delay some of the um, initiatives to establish um, the tech and, and sort of make sure that's in place to support it. So, yeah, really, really interesting, I think, there, but I don't think surprising either. Do you agree, Viv? No, not really. Um, thanks. I wanted to add also on um, uncertainty about data protection law. Um, John Edwards mentioned earlier that we're publishing our training resources. And I think we have I think they are already on the website. Um, so that's something that you will help your staff as well as the guidance and other professional resources we have on our website. Yeah, are we getting in any questions? Um, um, we've got a few um, questions coming in, but by all means, um, keep submitting your questions and we'll be happy to answer those at the end. OK, well, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. 
excuse me, I'll just do it. There we are. Oh, it hasn't moved. Next slide. I need the man, Chris Whitty, to move the slide to the next one. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> the data sharing code. Now, as you can see, that's a picture of the code on our website. We commend it to you. Um, it provides practical guidance to you both on the law and on good practice in data sharing. It links out to the current bang up to date ICO website guidance on particular topics, so you always have the latest position. It contains real life case studies and tips to help you. The code busts myths around data sharing, including fear of being fined, more on this later, and it directs you to our guidance on subjects such as lawful basis. One myth is that you need a child's consent to share data. Sometimes consent in data protection terms, i.e. lawful basis, is conflated with other procedures and practices of organisations. I've come across this erroneous belief in the context of some charities sharing the data of homeless people. And, and we discussed that and resolved it. But I understand that there is a requirement for individuals to give their consent, not a data, not data protection consent, to be referred to a local authority for support. This is completely separate. It's unfortunately the same word. This is completely separate from the data protection lawful basis of consent, and you shouldn't confuse the two. Be clear about what what the meaning is. You don't need consent to share a child's data for safeguarding purposes, and we really wouldn't recommend it anyway for a number of reasons. Instead, if you're a public sector organisation, consider the lawful basis of public task private or third sector, consider legitimate interests. Check out our lawful basis tool on the website to identify the appropriate lawful basis for you. There's a link in the data sharing code, but if you also enter it into the search box on the website, you may well be able to find it that way. And finally, I also wanted to say, don't forget to ask to use your DPO. Don't be afraid to ask them. Um, they're there to help you and they can help you with any questions you have about data sharing. So my screen is freezing again. OK, um, next slide, please, as my clicker isn't working. I'm not sure if there's. Oh, right. Thank you. We also have a data sharing hub. Information hub, which includes a law enforcement toolkit and other resources to help you. We're keen to expand the resources in the hub. And earlier this year, we published two new case studies on sharing data with Ofsted. We produced it jointly with them. And we also very recently published four new case studies to support data sharing in the healthcare sector that we produced jointly with the NHS in England. Now, we'd like you to tell us if you have suggestions for further case studies that would be useful to you. Please see the email address on screen. Data sharing code, that's lowercase or one word, data sharing code at ico.org. Dot UK. You can also use this email address to make any comments that you didn't manage to do today. This slide, don't be afraid of a fine. We've heard from the poll that that is something you worry about. We're aware that people have said they're afraid to share data because the risk of an ICO fine if they get something wrong. This is mistaken. As the slide sets out, we are a proportionate regulator and we prefer to work with organisations if a complaint reaches us. We focus the use of our enforcement powers on reckless and deliberate harms with fines only issued in the most serious cases. 
where there's reckless and deliberate harms, as I said. We don't need to pe we don't seek to penalise organisations where a member of staff has shared data in good faith and in the public interest, such as to protect, to safeguard a child, but has made a genuine mistake. We have explained this in the data sharing code, but I wanted to emphasise it again here. Now, on our revised approach to enforcement, the Commissioner has recently announced a revised approach to enforcement against public authorities on a trial basis. We want to work more effectively with the public sector using the Commissioner's discretion to reduce the impact of fines on them and on the public purse. We'll use our wider powers more warnings, reprimands and enforcement notices with fines only issued in the most serious cases. We'll make better use of engagement, including publicising lessons learned and sharing good practice. We'll be working even more closely with the public sector to encourage compliance with data protection law and prevent harms before they happen. See our website for more details. Next, we have a brief video message from John Edwards. If there's one thing you take away from this session, I hope it's this. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Edwards, the Information Commissioner. That means it's my job to administer and enforce the UK GDPR. And I want to tell you today that wherever you work, whether it's in health or law enforcement or education or the care sector, and you have information about a child that you think might be at risk, you won't get into trouble if you share that information with someone who's in a position to do something about that. OK, thanks, thanks John, for doing that. Um, we now have, I think, hopefully, we've got quite a number of questions that we're both going to answer, Stacey. Yeah, we have. I've just been having a look through some of them, so we can definitely work our way through um, some of those now. So um, the first one is more of a comment, probably actually, within a question. Um, so it says the ICO could advertise the work that they are doing in this area more clearly, as I was not aware of this work um, as DPO for children and social services. Um, so I think that's maybe referencing the work that we're doing with the, the Children's Commissioner. Mm -hmm. So interesting comment there. To OK, right, well, noted. Thank you. Um, so then going on to questions, um, we've got one here. I, wor I work at the DPO for um, a school and church. With regards to ICOs working with the Children's Commissioner, was, would this be as relevant for organisations in Scotland? Thank you. We are. Um, we know there are differences and that you have um, all the ICO regions have their own Children's Commissioners and equivalents. And it is something that we will be working on with our regional offices. We just started with the Children's Commissioner because um, it arose in the context of a meeting. Um, in which they were involved, but we will not, we won't be neglecting Scotland. Thanks, Viv. Um, another one here. It's an interesting comment, but with like a bit of a question involved as well. Um, saying I agree that cultural embedded practices are often the bigger blocker than actual DP issues, and um, so that's an interesting perspective. That's not something the ICO can single-handedly solve. But is there more you could be doing to promote this to influence thinking? Um, I guess that kind of talks towards some of the children's commissioner work, doesn't it, Viv? Yes, it does. Um, yeah, and it's something that we we are taking on board, and uh, yeah, it's something we can work on together. This is part of the process. And we will be doing taking measures to publicise any resource we produce, but this is part of that process as well. And uh, for anyone who missed it today or who signed up, I hope you spread the word, but they will be able to access this video online afterwards. Um, yeah, I hope, you, I hope it's helpful. 
you've read the mind of one of the other questions as well because it says will this session be available online after the conference yes, so you've real. also answered that one <laughs> oh, me. It was, you just made me sidekick right. <laughs> um so we've got another one here and it says how can children get their rights actioned what happens when the children themselves want their data destroyed I don't know if this is perhaps talking around some of the sort of um, consent issues and, and the right to be safeguarded. Yes, and it's the right um, to have your data amended or destroyed, which is a um, slightly different issue than what we're talking today. But yes, talking about today, um, but children do have rights. Obviously, they do. Um, it is a slightly different issue. If it's something that they f you feel we you want us to cover in our resource, then we will do so and we will consider doing so. Um, what do you think, Stacey? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's it's obviously I think we're I think we're kind of doing a lot more work now to make children aware of um, their rights. The stuff um, with schools, the resources we don't yes. schools, yes. Yes, yeah, that's the more resources for schools, which I think are on our website. Um, yes, I think I'm pretty sure they are. Um, but it's a very, very good point. They they do have their own rights. Um, another interesting comment here and probably got time for maybe one more question before we wrap up. But just as sometimes it is right to refuse to share. Um, for example, recently some train managers were walking up and down trains filming everyone indiscriminately, including children. No one was safeguarded and many were treated like criminals unfairly and unlawfully. Um, so I think that's talking to the fact that, um, you know, yes, absolutely data sharing won't be appropriate in, in all circumstances. I think the message that we're, you know, trying to clearly get across here is that where there's a clear safeguarding need, then, mm -hmm. you know, you can absolutely share that information. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that doesn't mean you can share everything and uh, um, that's obviously not a good incident. If somebody has a concern about that, um, they should let us know about it via our website to chat if there is a concern. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then just one final one to finish on on here before we wrap up. It just says 100% agree on confusion being caused by consent, meaning different things depending on the context. So. I just encourage you to probably post in the chat there in terms of how we can how you think we can help more with with that and how we can kind of help with that confusion. Um, but I, I think obviously if we've got any particular questions that we didn't get round to answering, um, then I'm not sure if we've got something in place where we're going to try and answer that sort of follow up afterwards. It's um it's technically difficult for actually to answer directly into the chat, but we are record, we are writing down all the things that um, have been asked and raised uh, are not they're not associated with your names. If you do have anything that you didn't manage to put down, please do put them on that website, that email address, which I will repeat again at the end. OK, thanks. Ben. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Stacey and everybody in the background who helped with that. Um, there we are. Hopefully that's taken us to the next slide. It hasn't. I need to be Chris Whitty again. Thank you very much. Um, so we have work to do and we'll use your comments and responses to help this. Please contact us if you want to say anything else on this topic at data sharing code, one word, data sharing code at ico.org.uk. Thank you very much for joining us at the conference today. We hope you found the day useful. And in this session, which is in the final and hottest slot of the day too, that drink looks nice, Stacey. Please don't forget to add any comments in the chat. It's your last chance to do so. Otherwise, you can use that email address. Also, you'll be getting a feedback form tomorrow, Wednesday. So please, would you complete that because your input helps us shape future events. And finally, the virtual meeting hub will remain open until 4.30 p.m. if delegates would like to meet up after the conference closes. Thanks once again and goodbye. <laughs>